My humble respect to Guru Mahan, Guru Piran Sivasangaran, Guru Piranyo, fellow Nyanis. Uh, today I'm going to continue from uh, last week, the science of meditation. This is part two. Uh, how do we prepare for meditation? Last week I covered <clears throat> what are the different types of meditation, why meditation is really important. So I defined what meditation is, the different types of meditation, why meditation is important. Uh, this is a common question that most people um, ask me. That, uh, you know, when I first learned to meditate, uh, I find it very difficult to uh, focus and concentrate. So here I want to say that, you know, when we start meditation, we have to, you know, uh, prepare for meditation. You know, uh, many people come to meditation for many reasons. You know, some come because, you know, they want to get better, uh, you know, improve their physical health or their mental health. They may have challenges. Some uh, come to meditation because of uh, they were, they're seeking for happiness and joy uh, in their lives. Um, others, you know, perhaps they are, you know, wanting to study or they're in school or in university. They want to do very well. They're struggling. Um, others want to do well in their business or in their relationships, whether it's family or friends. Uh, but there are others, you know, who have a different set of goals. They have a very, uh, you know, lofty goal of wanting to discover who they are, you know, attain self-realization or, or God-realization or live a more enlightened life, right? So whatever that is for them. But whatever the objective of this meditational, uh, you know, pursuit that we take, um, you know, or whatever types of meditation that we take, uh, you know, one of the things that we have to realize is that we have to prepare for uh, meditation. <clears throat> this is something that most people don't do. You see, you know, in everything in life, you know, whether when we are first starting to go to school, say kindergarten, our parents prepare us for school. The same thing in primary or secondary or university, you know, there's a sense of preparation that takes place, you know, in all the stages of preparation, including, you know, when you finish your high school, you know, they prepare you for your university and work life. So there is a preparation that takes place. Uh, the same thing we see that, you know, when we want to get married uh, or, you know, also there's a sense of preparation, you know, first, you know, you meet the person, you get to know them, you know, there's a falling in love period. Or you know, arrange uh, you know a mutually agreed um, you know pursuit of you know coming and establishing a family. So there's a whole range of preparation that takes place. The same thing with having a child or family, starting a family. We see that you know uh, there's a sense of preparation that that one needs to prepare, right? So we see that in all everything in our lives, if we prepare very well we can try to uh, mitigate all the, you know, risks or, uh, you know, our chances of achieving the outcomes becomes very good, whether it's in our studies or in our businesses or in our relationships or starting a family and nurturing a good family. A well-prepared mind tend to execute or implement things in a much more systematic and a more efficient way. So we see this, uh, a lot in our own, uh, the way our mind is organized. In that same way, meditation is no different. You know, uh, we need to prepare for meditation. So we really have to take it very, very seriously that if we really want to get the outcomes of meditation, be very successful in everything that we do from, you know, our studies right up to, you know, attaining enlightenment, this meditational, uh, you know, uh, practice needs to be given a little bit more attention, a little bit more preparation and so on. So what I'm going to share with you is uh, how, you know, uh, observing Mahan, observing Mahan's life, observing other Mahans, uh, observing my own, 
my father who was a you know guru piranse sangaran uh, my own gurus you know uh, guru leong who was my guide guru piranyo uh, who essentially you know uh, appointed me as a guru and the fourth guru piran i i stayed with all of them and learned a lot of things from them through their teachings their way of life and a few things i saw they were all, they always took their meditation very very seriously they put their meditational practice and their service of meditational practice as the number one priority in their lives and when they did that they see that you know they everything you know folded for the meditation and the meditation enhanced everything else so a few things you know the same thing with my own uh, research supervisors that helped me with all my research work and my studies they too had that mindset always prepare they always say prepare 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 when you prepare really well you know you are able to think through things better you are able to implement strategies you are able to mitigate any risks but to prepare for meditation this is something that is very very important right we see that you know meditation is essentially to help our mind to be focused our mind to be able to get a sense of quietude a sense of clarity in the clarity comes better understanding of how we generate the thoughts better understanding of who we are as a being so i see meditation as somewhat like a training wheels if all of you all have uh, you know uh, ride a bicycle you'll see that in the first instance you would not be able to get the balance so meditation is a training wheel to help us get a balance of our mind right what do i mean by that you see when we first start practicing you know you all would have had a bicycle something like this and we could not balance it ourselves so you have two wheels on the side there to help us not drop off our um, you know uh, bicycle so the two wheels are to help us guide us to keep us focused keep us you know from uh, you know following our journey <clears throat> so this bicycle over time we see that once we master how to cycle pedal get the rhythm slowly slowly we will remove one of the training wheels and balance on the other side eventually we see that we remove that training wheels and somebody will hold you and push you and then let you go for a while you can get the balance and then you may fall down and you keep trying and trying and one fine day you start getting the balance like here in this picture right so uh, like how einstein now is cycling you know with a lot of balance right so and we see that sometime after you slowly without the training wheels you keep falling and eventually one fine day you get it right so once you get it uh, it is very interesting that uh, you know as what einstein's his life is like a riding a bicycle to keep your balance you must keep moving so this is where even in meditation if you want to progress you have to keep pursuing this intensively and something very interesting that happens is the law of physics that says that when we get balance something happens in our mind it's a balance that take place and there is this thing called when we are riding that centrifugal and centripetal force the force that is pulling and pushing becomes balance in our in our mind so even though you are practice you you are cycling you know you cycled 30 40 years you've got it when you are young and then you stop cycling and when you get on to the bicycle the mind knows how to do the balance so we see that the 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 whole idea of cycling is actually balancing the centrifugal and centripetal force in that same way we, we see that once we meditation is to help us to get that balance between the push and the pull force the things that we don't like we push 
the things that we like, we pull. And we see that we are caught between the two. Every day, you know, every moment. But the gurus teach you, okay, put the training wheels of meditation. Forget about the, you know, so that you don't fall. Let's help you to get the balance. And then slowly they remove the meditational practice, you know, and for you to start getting that, you know, vibration or that balance. The guru holds you like a father and eventually say, okay, now you're on your own, right? It's the same process. The mind learns to, from, gets the support from the training wheels and after a while it becomes independent. But one needs to keep cycling. Now, if you don't get that moment of balance, if you always use your training wheels, you will never get the balance. So there comes a stage where you have to slowly liberate yourself from that balance, that training wheels, and eventually you will get the balance. And once you get it, your mind will never forget it. But if you don't do it, you will never get it. Right? So you have to keep trying and trying until you get that balance. Right? So we see this happening in this meditational practice. So meditation is a training wheels for the mind to get that focus and balance. So what happens in, in a person who's starting to meditate? <clears throat> Something very interesting happens. So we all have tried meditating. Uh, all of us have been early stage meditators. Here are some of the challenges that one goes through. And these are some of the challenges that I went through and the things that I learned from my gurus, right? So we see that for an ordinary human being, you know, there's so many thoughts that are coming, you know, thoughts about, you know, uh, family, thoughts about money, thoughts about work, thoughts about bosses, thoughts about all kinds of thoughts that comes. When you sit down for meditation, it magnifies even further. So you see an ordinary human mind, so much thoughts that are bombarding, you know, the mind is just, you know, racing ahead. So this makes it very difficult to meditate for many of them to get that calm, cool balance. So this is where, uh, you know, I saw what my gurus were doing. I saw, I, I looked at the instructions of my gurus in their own manuals, in their own way of life. And I realized that, yes, all of us go through this stage. You know, I've been practicing for more than 40 over years. You know, the first few months, the first year, two years was not easy. Many, many things. And if you are starting at a very early age, obviously, there's also hormones in place. There are many, you're, you're preoccupied with many things. You have other priorities, right? So the same thing when you're older, you see that when you're starting to practice, it's a little bit more challenging because you have, other challenges like health challenges and you know worries and so on. So an ordinary human mind, when they first start to meditate, a lot of thoughts and the thoughts, you know, one after the other, and it is very difficult to get that balance. I know, I understand. So here is what some of the things that we want to, I want to show you that you can prepare yourself for this meditation. So how do we move from that so many thoughts, multiple thoughts, you know, one after the other, continuously magnifying one another? How do I create that one thought? Just one thought. Instead of so many thoughts, how do I create that optional thought other than my material thoughts, right? How do I create this? So this is where the meditational practices the Guru gives you, as I said, about 10 different types of meditational methods are given for you to now focus, instead of focusing on all the other thoughts, just focus on this one thought, this optional thought, right? Every master has their own way of generating that optional thought, whether it's through breathing or whether through mantra, or whether through a practice. Mahan has his own practice of how to get that optional thought, which I'll speak about in the you know subsequent uh, uh, classes. So to create, instead of having a thought like this, a mind like this, to create one thought, right? And that requires a fair bit of practice to get it. And as you progress at one thought, 
the thoughts become more and more calmer, more and more sublime, more, you know, uh, you know, more and more the frequency starts becoming more and more subtle. So there is a difference between that and this, right? So you start off with really, really very volatile, so many things you move towards. Okay, one thought, still there's some, you know, uh, upward and downward movement in that frequency. And as you pursue, it becomes more and more sublime. And eventually, even that too disappears. You get that absolute silence, that quietitude. And this is the kind of a coming to that fruition of that meditational practice, whatever the practice is that is taught to you. But to get to this level requires some preparation. For many people, it doesn't happen very, very quickly. But there are a few things that you can do to get to this state. So what is this first thing? And the first thing is that we have to, like how when you want to create a bonfire, we have to put the bricks, we have to put the wood, we have to put all those combustible material and then light it up. So there's a preparation that takes place, as I said earlier. So what is the first thing that, that there are 10 uh, steps that you have to take to prepare yourself for meditation? Right. So you really have to take it seriously like everything else from your primary school first day right up to, you know, getting married and, you know, having children and all those things. So the first thing is that you have to make sure your body is healthy. That means that the body must be well toned because to sit in a lotus position like this is the best position for meditation. That and sometimes you have to sit for 20 minutes to half an hour. Now, if your body is not torn, you see that, uh, you know, blood circulation is, is constricted. You get numbness of the leg. So it's difficult for you to concentrate, right? So the first thing is that the body health is very important. So keeping the body well toned is very important. How do you do this? You do some stretching exercises, right? Do some walking every day. Uh, pick up some yoga, no need intensive yoga, the simple yoga, simple asanas to stretch the body, stretch all your nerves, you know, playing games, you know, it's very important to keep the body at tone, playing games, you know, when we were young, we used to play a lot of games, even Guru Sankaran was an avid sports person, right? The other aspect is learning to breathe properly. This is very, very important. Breathing exercise is very important. When you're first starting to meditate, learn to breathe properly. What does that mean? You know, you don't close your eyes, tip of the nose, three quarter, take a deep breath, a diaphragmatic breath, you know, for about, you know, a minute, deep breath. And allow and hold it. Allow the air to circulate throughout your lungs, fill up its diaphragmatic breathing, full, right? Leave it there for, you know, about 20 to 30 seconds. The longer, the better. Let it percolate, let the, you know, oxygen circulate throughout, be absorbed, and exchange of carbon dioxide in your lungs. And then you exhale completely in a diaphragmatic way, pushing everything out. And you do that for the first 15, 20 minutes. And you see something very interesting happens. So closing your eyes, taking deep diaphragmatic, the whole diaphragm must move, right? Allow the whole lungs to be filled. Hold it for about 30 seconds to 45 seconds. And then expunge it completely, you know? And you do that for 15 to 20 minutes something very interesting happened. All the thoughts in your mind. Now you're conscious of your breathing. All the thoughts, all the noise will calm down for several reasons. Number one, your focus has now shifted from the thoughts to the breathing. Number two is that when you breathe like that, what happens is that you now fill your whole body with oxygen. That means your lungs is now transmitting all the oxygen throughout your blood. Your blood is fully nourished with oxygen 
oxygen is very important for the cells. It's important energy source for the cells, you know, throughout your body and your brain. Now your brain is nourished, your body is nourished, you feel so energetic, you feel so alert, you feel so, you know, uh, refreshed, right? And what happens is that your heart now starts, you know, not palpitating, right? But when you don't breathe properly, when you have, you know, you know, a fraction of what your breath is, that means that your body is getting less oxygen, which means that the heart has to work harder to circulate the oxygen throughout the body. And the heart is working on an overtime. So you see that you get tired very fast. You know, sometimes people, you know, not enough oxygen, you know, the cells are not getting enough oxygen. It sends the signals to the brain, I'm not getting enough oxygen. The brain sends hormones, the hormones go to your heart, your heart starts pumping more. So you start seeing over time, your, you start getting high blood pressure. So this deep meditation state, 15 to 20 minutes, you do that every day. You see that your mind becomes calm, your heart health is very good, your body get all the oxygen. You see that your, you know, when the brain, when your body gets all the oxygen and nourished, you see that the frequency of your brain, because now it's not telling I, I the body lacks or the brain lacks oxygen, you've got to do something. All the hormone levels become more and more harmonized. Your heart, you know, beats in a much more harmonized way. And you see that your pressure improves significantly. So this is the first step of, you know, the bodily health, right? Keeping it well taught through exercise and including breathing exercise. If your body is not healthy, you will not be able to meditate properly. Number two is that you have to have good sleep, right? Sleep is vital for the brain to have good rest, clean off all the toxins in the brain. Every time you, you are awake and doing things and there's a lot of exchange of the neural connection, there's a lot of accumulation of various chemicals, there's a buildup. So the deep sleep state will help clean it up, completely wipe it out. And you start off afresh. So deep sleep is very important. So you should get about six to seven hours of sleep. If you're older, you need more sleep. Occasionally, you can have naps. Naps also rejuvenate the brains, right? It also helps with the meditation. Here it is a modern lifestyle problem. Most people compromise their sleep because they are always on their mobile phone, smartphone, you know, TV, internet. So they are continuous, the brain is continuously, you know, getting stimulation, but it's not getting enough rest. So what happens? The brain gets tired, the body gets tired, it is very difficult to meditate. So whenever they start meditating, they fall asleep. So here again, good sleep, go to bed by 10, 10, 30, wake up at four o'clock. But right? every day you do this routine. Occasionally, you know, you can take short naps, you know, in the afternoon or just to rejuvenate yourself. So this is another part of keeping the body and the brain healthy for you to get the best outcome from your meditational practice. The third aspect is food, nutrition. You have to eat healthily, right? Because your bodily cells, all your organs, including your brain, needs food, needs energy. Right? So you've got to eat a balanced food, which means that lots of vegetables, fruits, nuts, lentils. You can have some protein, you know, but limit that protein and carbohydrates. Yes, carbohydrates are very important for the body, right? Our rice. But don't overeat carbs because your sugar level will go up and other problems start creeping. So have balanced food. And also make sure that you eat on time. And not eat too late or not overeat because then the body has to go over time to, to digest the food. You know, drink lots of water because water is very important to cleanse the body. Water is also very important to dilute things, right? To have to help chemical processes in the body, right? So it's very important for the system drinking a lot of warm water, right? Most important is don't eat heavy meals before meditation because 
all the blood will rush to digest the food. It's hard for you to concentrate. Right? So again, here's another tip that you want to do is that, you know, food, nutrition is very important, but eating it properly, timely, you know, and most importantly, not overeat, especially before meditation. The other aspect of food is that try not to consume alcohol because alcohol has a disruptive effect on the brain and the cellular activities. Also with tobacco or illicit drugs. These are things that can adversely impact your body, bodily function, the chemicals, the hormones. And if you, you know, indulge in it, it's very difficult to, to practice meditation properly. The other aspect is also on having a positive mindset, right? If you want to get the best out of meditation, you have to nurture a positive mindset. You have made up your mind. I want to get the best outcome of meditation. You know, all the health benefits, mental health benefits, you know, a more inspirational mind, a more positive, a more productive mind, you know, and ultimately enlightenment. So you've got to watch your mind very, very carefully. Nurture positive mindset, avoid negativity, you know, and very destructive things in your life. There are many people I see they're very, very sharp with their words, cut people down, you know, try to avoid those things. The mind must be very subtle and gentle so that it's not, you know, the vibration is not too intensive. Right? <clears throat> I will speak more about this because this is uh, something that many people find it very uh, challenging. And I'll spend some time later on on how to create that positive mindset so that our waves are more and more subtle. The other aspect is actually, you know, uh, nurturing, kind, caring, and gracefulness in our thoughts, speech, and actions. It's related to the positive mindset, but in a more subtle way, right? You know, when you want to get the best outcome of meditation, you have to show empathy. You have to have that caringness. You have to have that gentleness, both in our thoughts, in our speech and actions. You see that the great masters always are very gentle in their words and their approaches. Right? So, uh, you know, uh, this is something that we see that sometimes when people, you know, become very good in their meditation, you have to be careful that the ego doesn't grow with it. Right? So always watch how you think, be kind, be generous, you know, with your thoughts, your time, the resources. And this actually helps a lot, reinforces your meditational sadhana. So again, you know, uh, if, if there are things that we, if we can't, uh, if there are no good things that we, 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 we have in our mind, don't say it, be quiet. Or if you have done anything, if you don't have anything good to do, don't do anything. Best is to be quiet. No action is the best action. Right? Uh, and we see that this, you know, this is now the fifth quality that we should nurture. These are simple qualities, but yet it has a profound impact on our on our mindset. Right? So we see that the other one is that I, I know one of the things that has really helped me and I learned from Mahan and Guru Sangran is listening to inspirational people. You know, um, Guru Sangran used to listen to a lot of Mahan's speech over and over again. You know, he used to listen to great satsangs on, on Upanishads, on the great teachings, you know. Uh, he loved music. You know, he loved Carnatic music. You know, he loved classical music, particularly, you know, Carnatic music, which is all about soul enriching, Right. And I have some of the songs that they used to play, which is so inspiring. You know, Mahan, when he wakes up 4, 4.30 in the morning, you can hear beautiful music, melodies that are very inspirational. Same thing, Guru Sangaran. So these are things that helps to calm the frequency in the mind. You know, you can listen to beautiful melodies, you know, violin, uh, you know, sitar, you know, a whole bunch of... Uh, I, I love this Chinese... Uh, uh, you know, uh, instrument called Erfu, which is so beautiful when you listen in a very intensive way, you can feel the vibration. Right? So listening to inspirational people and music, and sometimes when I go for my walk, 
I, I listen to this and it's kind of gives you a calm and soothing feeling and inspirational feeling. The other aspect is actually be in the orbit of inspirational personalities, right? Be around inspirational people, you know, always having that close contact, always having that conversation. You know, even sometimes you may be down when you come in their presence, you feel elevated, inspired, having their books, having, you know, speaking to them, you know, all this inspires, uh, you know, uh, those days before internet and telephone and so on. Uh, I remember Guru Sangran used to write almost every week to Mahan. And I have all the correspondence that Mahan will respond back, you know, and the conversation. Today we have internet instantaneously. We can speak to people. But those days they have to wait for the mail, you know, or telegrams. And yet the guru disciple bond was so strong through this, you know, and obviously when Mahan visited, he used to stay in our home and there was this close, you know, connection and vibration that we got from him. But even though he was physically not there, there was always that communication that the Guru Sankaran had that kept his mind in the orbit of his guru. The same thing, you know, being in the orbit of great thinkers, philosophers, scientists, help us refine our mind. In that same way, when we are among negative people, people who are destructive, you know, slowly, slowly, we will start imbibing those values too, right? So if you're among those who drink a lot of alcohol, one fine day you will drink. If you're among people who are smoking a lot, you know, slowly you will see you'll imbibe that. This is called mental osmosis, right? The more you are, you know, with people of a certain quality, you imbibe those values. So one of the things is be in the orbit of inspirational personality, whether they're physically there or you're reading their books or having their conversation or listening to them, it helps the mind to refocus from that external noisy world to the inspirational personalities and their vibrations. So we see this, is I for me this was very very helpful reading autobiography of great people, listening to them you know, uh, being in the presence of them really helps you to be you know the mind to be more calmer and cooler. <clears throat> the other aspect is also which is really important is that for our mind to really stay focused we have to read a lot. We have come to a stage where people do not read enough. We, we, you know, there's no more reading culture. We are in a TikTok culture. Everybody wants in a few seconds. So there is no the discipline to see that through at a longer period. So the TikTok culture has replaced the reading culture. But reading is one of the most best way to focus and give you that mindfulness in the meditational state. Not only reading, but also we see that, you know, we need to, when we read it, we have to reflect what we are reading, you know, why this is really important, introspecting how this is related to me. So that inner journey of thinking, you know, why did the author write it in this way? What is running in the author's mind? How does it relate to me? And contemplate how, if I did this, what would my circumstances be? If I incorporate this knowledge, how would the change happen in me? So this reading, reflecting, introspecting, contemplating is one of the best ways of helping the mind stay focused. This is, you know, reading and contemplating about deep philosophies, uh, teachings of great, great Mahans and thinkers and scientific works and the scriptures. Scriptures, you know, no matter what the scriptures are, you know, every scripture has elements of, you know, divinity really intensively reading this is, is, is really helpful, really challenges the way we think, you know, push our mind, you know, to a, a level of really to the boundary of knowledge. The other aspect that I saw in all my gurus and the teachers is that they undertook pro-social activities. They always not only were thinking about themselves, but the people around them. How do I make life better? You know, how do I improve people's life by teaching them new things that I've learned, the kind of tips that I, I picked up, you know. Uh, so this is how Mahan wrote the I Got Book. He 
learned it, he discovered certain things, he documented his experience, and he says, look, here it is that I have tried, It's this has worked for me, this did not work, try it out yourselves, right? So, and so he was actually giving knowledge to liberate people. The others, you know, and not only that, the other one is looked at, you know, people who are very needy, you know, maybe they lack that knowledge, you know, the illumination, giving them that help, vulnerable communities, you know, they may have difficulty with, you know, putting food on the table or clothing or schooling. How do we make a difference? This is where you see that the mind is no more focusing on our problems, but the mind is starting to focus on how to solve problems of others in that process we solve our problem in terms of the volatile mind. The mind becomes more resolute. The mind becomes more quiet. The mind becomes more focused to finding a solution for others in that process. The mind, you are, and the, the whole idea of helping others help you to create a calm, cool, and steady mind. This is the beauty of service, right? So every one of those elements have a beautiful way of calming and, you know, creating this sense of sublimity in the human mind. And the last one is actually, you know, becoming very people friendly. You see that when you start doing this, a sense of courage, a sense of, you know, universality, a sense of, you know, uh, you become very, uh, you know, build your social intelligence and emotional intelligence you become people friendly you would never have anyone that you dislike you know you would never have enemies everything you know you you love life you love people you love nature you see you become more and more nature centric and in that process of becoming more and more nature centric we unlock the natural beauty that lies within us the power of nature that is incorporated in our DNA. And as we do that, slowly, slowly, that material world becomes quiet. The natural force in us become more and more powerful, strong, and vibrate at a much more profound way. And we can hear that inner force within ourselves. And the inner force becomes the anchor the training wheels, the natural training wheels that guides us to the path of the highway to infinity, right? So this is some of the 10 key steps over the years I discovered that, wow, you become more and more people-centric, more planet-friendly, more nature-centric, and nature slowly starts revealing itself from within you. After all, you know, we were all born from the nature and nature's DNA was in us, always was, right? The only thing is that we have so caught up with our ego and everything that we think we are the greatest, this material thing is the greatest and we get caught up with all the material things and our mind is in a knot, right? So here are some of the 10 steps that unknots the mind, you know, and frees the mind so that the next journey of sublimity and quietude, you can transcend that noisy mind to this more peaceful, quiet mind, which is the prelude to the next state of intensifying that self-discovery. So this is what I learned from my gurus. You know, as long as I'm in the surface of my experiences, I will always have to experience the turbulence. The moment I start practicing these 10 things, you see that I start, you know, descending deeper and deeper within me. And there's a sense of serenity, a sense of quietude that I can pursue further to the depth of my own creation. And this is what, you know, I learned that we have to prepare for this journey every day, every moment. And we see that, you know, the turbulent mind can become a peaceful mind if we took these 10 preparatory steps, you know, 
And when we are prepared, when the mind is prepared, right? Many people come to me for practicing this meditation in the turbulent mind. And sometimes, you know, even though we teach them how to practice their meditation, they find it very difficult. But the moment when they start preparing for this meditation, you see that their meditation starts improving. Instead of so many noise, the, 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 the vibration is more calmer and more cooler. That optional thoughts become more and more profound. Hey, they say, I feel a vibration in me. All the noise has stopped. I feel more peaceful. There's a sense of serenity that comes. I can feel the inner resonance. So you see that when you prepare yourself and you come to the state, the work of the Guru is so easy. In the presence of the Guru, you can feel the vibration. Even the Guru doesn't have to initiate you. In the presence of the Guru, you feel that vibration. So here is the 10 steps that I want to share with you that will help you to transcend that turbulent mind to a peaceful mind. No matter what the practices you're practicing, if you took these 10 approaches to your life every day, whatever you practice, you'd feel that profound impact, profound change, the profound value it creates to your life. Next class, I'll speak about, you know, how do we transform our mind? What are the qualities of the mind that we need to nurture to get us to that peaceful mind state? I want to spend a little bit more time with the qualities of the mind. The qualities of the mind that actually brings out the asuric quality. So the qualities of the mind that brings it the sattvic quality, the divine qualities, the divine virtues. And the qualities of the mind brings the asuric values that causes a lot of turbulence. So how do we differentiate the two and how do we bring it all to a state of divinity that the woman, the guru, gives you that instruction so the initiation you get boom, very quickly. So the next class, I'll spend a little bit more time on preparatory steps, but focusing on the qualities of the human mind. Sandoshok.